Welcome to this movie that's going to cover how to install a collet closure and then a collet and a part on a lathe. Uh, this is going to be described by Don Howard, our master mechanic, and also helping him will be his sidekick, yours truly, John Waddock. In the collet closure, many of the same procedures that we used with the uh, three-jaw chuck will be used once again. We're going to have to prepare the spindle, stone and clean it, match the serial numbers, install the collet closure. It'll be similar to installing a three-draw chuck. We'll also have to talk about how to install the collet into the collet closure, then how to put a part into the collet, removing the part, collet, and closure, and then we'll finish this movie up talking about the chuck key safety. Let's talk about preparing the spindle with Don Howard. All right, we're back on the lathe here at the beautiful Applied Technology Center with uh, Don Howard, Master Craftsman, also John Waddock, no craftsman uh, whatsoever. Uh, Don, last time we put a three-jaw chuck on, uh, but sometimes we don't want to use a three-jaw chuck. We want to use something called a collet closure, and why would we want to use a collet closure in collets? All right, collet closure uh, is a little more accurate, more repeatability. And it's a ease of use for a student or for any manufacturing individual. All right, so uh, Don, we're going to just quickly review um, from the last video. We have to clean off the, the spindle, right? Uh, now, does that include the holes down in there, too? No, I'm not going to get down inside there. Normally, would you have to clean those? They should stay clean because we're pushing in our chuck and pulling out our chuck. Okay. They should stay clean, all right? If you happen to see dirt or grease down there, yeah, certainly get it out. So Don's cleaning off the face and also a part of the spindle. This is known as the nose. Spindle nose. Spindle nose. Okay. Um, now, if you <laughs> lie, does that get longer? Oh, no. Okay. Down here, it's too hard. <laughs> okay. All right. So, well, in any case, don't lie to your instructor in, in any event. So Don's cleaning that up because just like a chuck, the collet closure is going to have to seat really nice. He cleaned it up last time. He stoned it. John, Don, if you just want to quickly show us what the stone, if there's any uh, chips that are embedded on there or the surface is marred somewhat, we're going to lightly stone. Uh, like Don said before, we are not trying to take any material off, just trying to smooth off the surface. Now, after you do a little bit of stoning, uh, this machine will then become stoned. Uh, okay, alcohol all related. Okay. So okay. All right. But it's nice and clean and shiny. I, I, I could eat my dinner off of that. I couldn't fit it there. But all right. So we've gone over this before. Uh, Jason, this, uh, this machine has a serial number, and it's going to have a matched collet. This is machine 139. So uh, Don got the piece of wood uh, that we've used before. That's going to support probably the collet. We come over to the table where 139 is. Don, this doesn't seem as heavy. And it, Now this has the 139 and it has a nice arrow. Can you see that, Jason? You can move your finger a little bit, Don. There you go. Now I can see that arrow, okay? Now, Don, we have to also check the cleanliness of this unit. Well, well, well. Now say that again. The reason we had to. The reason we had to check it is because you can see that we, this one has chips in it, and if I was just to slide this right over top of the spindle, these chips would get mushed in there, as you can see, like something like I just did to that one, and it would cause this thing to be cocked on the spindle nose. Well, you know, with this grease, we can pick up fingerprints, run it into the FBI database, and we can find the person who did that. But, Don, you're wiping off the fingerprints now. That's all right. We'll let this guy get away with it, right. but watch out in the future. All right. Um, we, sorry, we will not be doing fingerprinting, although maybe we should. Um, my son had to get his fingerprints done. Uh, no, he's not going to jail. Uh, to do his student teaching, he had to actually get his fingerprints. But don't leave any fingerprints anywhere around here. Make everything clean. That's the point of this. Don is stoning this again. We've seen this process before. He's, uh, you know, chips can actually get embedded into the steel by being pressed in there hard. Don's cleaning that up.
The other thing, if you leave these machines uh, dirty all the time, um, remember this is, well, upcoming as the fall semester, Santa Claus is going to find out that you have been naughty. You're not going to get any treats. Don, it looks like the last person uh, really failed to do what we've been talking about. <laughs> Either that or I'm really fussy. No, the last student definitely failed at what he was trying to do. All right, must not have been an engineering 153 student because even if you don't know how to machine, we want to make sure you know how to clean. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to have some kind of fallback skill. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Uh, we will also be teaching you some other marketable skills like pushing a broom. Uh, frying french fries, we don't have that here, but maybe you can pick that up at McDonald's. Let's do a quick review of preparing the spindle. You want to check to make sure the cam holes are open. We didn't mention that in this movie, but um, you want to, when you look into the holes of the spindle, you want to make sure you see a circular uh, shape. If not, you may have to turn some of the cam nuts uh, if someone's overturned them one way or the other. You need to wipe down all the surfaces, get all the grease and chips. If there's any chips that have been embedded into the surface, you need to lightly stone those surfaces. These are things we all did uh, already with the three-jaw chuck. And remember, the repeatability to make sure that uh, the collet closure is going to spin on the proper axis of the spindle. You need to make sure that those, uh, the, the collet closure and the spindle uh, are mating properly, and that requires ultimate cleanliness, especially in the nose area of the, uh, the, the spindle. Also in this segment, we've talked again about the serial number match and how important that is. So each lathe has a serial number that's been embedded into the ways on the right side and then you have to pick a, a collet closure that has a matching serial number and remember at the Applied Technology Center only the last three numbers of the serial number are used for identification. Remember each collet closure is customized for a given lathe. You don't want to miss and match these things because you won't get the proper um, you not get the proper repeatability and uh, the machine is not going to work as intended. So next we're going to look at installing the collet closure. All right, Don, you're lining up the arrows with the 139 arrow on collet closure and arrow on spindle. So this thing Don's putting on there is called the collet closure. Now you're just pushing that up snug. Now he's just snugging these down and remember, he started at 139, so when he gets back to 139, he knows... Now, notice Don is not cranking on this first one. He's just trying to make them all even. He's trying to get the collet closure to seat evenly. All right, now he's back to 139. Don is now cranking it. He's putting some muscle behind this. Uh, Don was uh, once a candidate, or could have been a candidate, for world's strongest man. Okay, um, you know, when he farted. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, okay. Uh, <laughs> strongest, strongest odor. Uh, <laughs> okay, so he's cranked that down. He's gotten back to 139. He knows he's done it all. He's moved the wood away. He's put the chuck key back. Hey, remember, folks, I'm going to say this again. Chuck key goes in two spots, in your hand or in its holder. You ever leave it here, okay, we will slap you upside the head so hard you won't know what hit you. So put this back. Do never leave it in here. Never. All right. All right, collet closure is in there. So if you have a collet closure done, then what's the collet? The collets you'll find on the end of your machine. The collets will be found towards the end of the machine and are basically spring. Um, uh, collets, all right? You'll find the size that you need in relationship to your part. Oh boy, that stock's oversized. All right, so Don, you, you just don't try to shove it in something too small. And we picked up a piece of stock that's not fitting into anything. All right, if that's one inch, there's two things that could be wrong. The material's oversized or just the collet itself is unsprung. All right, so it looks like we're going to do a little bit of measurement. Uh, so we're going to measure this piece of material. So Don's going to get 
Oh, this is a good thing. Don, will come on over. Don's going to use his uh, caliper that he bought in 1982. Um, still working fine. It's a dial caliper. Notice he's using the outside jaws, and he's trying to get a measurement of what uh, the diameter is. So what's it looking like, Don? It's about one inch five. One inch. So when when Don says one inch five, he means one inch plus five thousandths of an inch. Is that right, Don? Yes. Okay. So that's enough to mess it up. <laughs> yes. Okay. So. So what's the what, what's the what's the what's the diameter of that? He's measuring one inch. So that's what it should be. A one inch collet should be one inch. Right. Typically, you can force a collet five to seven thousandths. It's not recommended to do that because you start springing them. But they will collapse five to seven thousandths plus or minus. So I can use this. It's just that I wanted to check prior to just forcing it to make sure I'm not. Seating. All right, so this piece of material is about three to five thousandths over what it really should be. Don's going to check that once again, and I can see that it is, yeah, between two and probably four thousandths oversize. Uh, now, what will happen is it'll mar your part, it may ruin the collet. Uh, in this case, I'm only expanding it an extra three thousandths. I'm not going to really be too concerned about that. Um, but if I'm trying to push something in there that's too big or too small, I can damage or ruin the collet. So you don't want to. You want to be sure of the size of the material and the size of your collet. I mean, is there anything we can do to the material, or should we just go up to the next collet? Or if there's no collet, we go to the three jaw chuck. Correct. You would go to a three jaw chuck. If you can't go to the next collet size, it's going to be fifteen thousandths larger. Well, then that's too big for this material. So you would have to collapse the collet down too small. So now I'm uh, back to using my three-jaw chuck. All right, let's come on over here and just, I want to just show the idea of, of how the collet works by, you know, showing the next size up here, Don, which is uh, one and one sixteen. Now this is way too big, but at least it can show the idea. All right, so the material goes in and there's slots. There's three slots around the collet. So what's going to happen is, well, tell me what's going to happen. All right, what's going to happen inside your collet closure? You see this is called and considered a 5C taper, all right? You have a straight bodied, it gets with the threads on the end. As you tighten these threads up, it pulls the collet into the closure, and as it pulls it into the closure, there's a mating taper, all right? As you draw this into this taper, it closes down all the way around on this part. So now you get equal pressure all the way around your part. All right. So these slots that I see, Don, are going to eventually close up, and that's what tightens around the part. Yeah, the part, yes. The, these three jaws will actually close up around that part. Now, they'll event, after you take it out, they'll, they'll spring back like that? Yes, they will. Okay. All right. So Don is going to use the one-inch collet on this slightly oversized thing. Now, remember, you want to check with your lab instructor if you have oversized material like this to see if it's within the tolerance of being able to push it in there. You don't want to just take this with a hammer and just jam it into any collet you can find. All right. With using a collet and a collet closure, you see that on these collets you have a keyway in there. You have to locate this keyway matching the key inside your collet closure. So if I go put my finger in here, I can find where that keyway is. And it's also, I can see it with a set screw on the outside. So, so that set screw is where the keyway is? Yes. There's a keyway, and the key is inside here. So that gives me an idea where I should line it up. So if I- Can, can you feel that, that it's mating in there? Yes. If, I, if it's not mating in there, it just goes in here and it butts up against that key. And when I try to tighten it down, it won't pull the collet in. All right. So I have to rotate this until I feel it drop in. And you can see there's about a half inch of travel before the collet stops a second time. When the collet stops a second time, now I can rotate this, give it a little wiggle, and I can start rotating this using a chuck key. This has a scroll on it where it scrolls a thread and it tightens up the collets and you can see it drawing in the collets. Can you see that Jason? So it's drawing that collet in and it's closing up those gaps and it's decreasing the diameter. Now Don, why are you using this key and not that one over there? Specific size. The square on this matches the square on the collet closure. 
Okay, so it's not the same as this one over here. Okay, so it uh, doesn't work. Okay. All right, so you got to know which one. Now, is this over on the machine also? Yes, this one's located right here. Okay. Uh, same thing holds in, though, right, Don? We don't, we, it's that, that chuck is either in your hand. You notice I have not taken my hand off of it. All right, because even I can forget. I can get distracted. All it takes is a distraction. Your buddies call you, uh, hey, got a question for you. And you turn, you walk away, and you, you forget you did it. You come back over, and you flick the switch, and it, you turn it on. Um, I speak from experience. I've been in the shop. I've had chuck keys flying out of chucks, and it's not pretty. All right, so chuck key. Uh, so now, Don, you're kind of tightening up the, the collet closure, and you're pushing uh, the material into the collet. Correct. Now the same thing hold. How much of, of this material of the of the stock that we're going to be machining? How much should that be inside the collar? Um, <laughs> trick question. Well, would we say a, a, a minimum of something? Oh, you're going to have to have at least a quarter of an inch in there. Wow, that's all. It depends on what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's that say. Was the wrong question, so okay. How uh, much material can I have extending out from my collar? Would be better. All right. So you need to have at least a quarter inch in there, maybe a little more. Does it hurt to have a little more? No. Okay. The more the merrier. All right. So you, you get in there. Your instructor in lab is going to instruct you how much. Once again, you don't want more than five times the diameter of the material ever sticking out of a collet or out of a three-jaw chuck. So this is one-inch material, and uh, therefore I could have this out five inches, but that might be pushing it. All right, back to the minimums. You just use your, your common sense, if you have any, that if I'm only holding on a quarter inch of material and I'm sticking out at five inches, I stand a very good chance that if I touch the end of that five inch piece sticking out, that I'm going to rip that out of that collet. All right, so you got to use some of your common sense. All right. Well, but, you know, Don, I'm going to say this about common sense. It's usually based on, on common circumstances that people have seen. And if you've never been in a machine shop, you might not have much of that. I wouldn't. Um, so when in doubt, I guess we ask the instructor, does this make sense? Yes, absolutely. So if it's only sticking in, in there a quarter of an inch, you need to be careful is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Check with your instructor. All right. I think what Don's saying is with experience, someone would know when you could use a quarter inch and when you couldn't. Uh, obviously, the further this is sticking out, the more you'd want inside of there. I guess that's a fair Let's thing to say. Let's review the installation process for the collet that goes into the collet closure. Uh, first off, you want to make sure that the, you align the keyway of the collet, which is a, a groove that's been machined into the side of the collet. And that has to, uh, I guess that's called the keyway, and that has to be aligned with the key of the collet closure. So uh, how, how do you know if that's how those are aligned? Well, one way uh, is you can put your finger in and feel where the, uh, the key is inside of the collet closure, or you could just look at where the set screw is on the collet closure and know that that's where the key is and that's where you'd want to align your keyway for the collet. A check to see if your keyways and key are uh, properly aligned is to turn the collet closure nut and if you when you do this and in a clockwise direction you should draw the collet into the closure and uh, if turning that uh, nut doesn't pull the collet into the closure then you know you're not aligned properly. When we install the part, we uh, have to make sure that the part is the correct size for the collet. And that there are some limits on that. You don't want to be too big or too small. You need to have it just right, just like, uh, I guess, Goldilocks and the porridge there. Um, so when you have a one-inch collet, you do not want to put anything that's bigger than 1.005 inches into it. Um, now your instructor in lab will advise you if that number needs to be uh, adjusted somewhat. Um, but if you exceed that five thousandths of an inch and you try to pound it in with something, you're going to do something which Don said was spring the collet, uh, which means the collet 
jaws can move a little bit. But if you force them to move beyond what they were designed to move, then you're going to permanently uh, expand them and they'll never spring back. So you don't want to put something too big, nor do you want to put something too small, because the same thing could happen. If you put something too small and you tighten up the collet, and then those jaws, instead of coming down just a little bit to, uh, to embrace the part, they're, they're contracting more and more. You can bend those jaws too far inward and once again damage the collet forever. So once again, you don't want to put something in that's too big or too small. Uh, if you have any question whatsoever whether the part is appropriate um, for the given collet, ask your instructor first. And do what Don did. Measure what the diameter of your part is. Okay, so you know, is it just a little bit over? Is it a thousand or two thousands over? Which means, yeah, you could press it in. Or is it more than five thousand and you shouldn't? If you can't find a collet to match a given part, you can always use the three-jaw chuck. That can be expandable uh, to accommodate pretty much any diameter parts. Don mentioned this thing about a quarter inch inserted into the, the collet of your part. Now remember, Don said that's the very minimum under the best of circumstances. Okay, um, In most situations in lab you would never want to use that little amount of material sticking into a collet. For each given circumstance um, there's going to be uh, a, a specific amount that you need to push your collet in and that comes with experience. So please ask your instructor when using your lathe uh, how far should you stick your material in for your given operation. Keep in mind, the less length that you insert into the collet, the less secure and rigid it's going to be. Also, the same thing holds on the other side. If uh, you have a part in a collet, you don't want to have more than five times the diameter sticking out of the collet. Otherwise, you're going to be losing rigidity. All right. So the whole one of the main principles of good machining is to have your part highly rigid so it doesn't wobble, shake or vibrate. And this is done with a collet by, you know, inserting your part further into the collet and not extending it very far out of the collet. So for greatest rigidity, you want a lot of your part into the collet and not much of your part coming out of the collet. The last step is once your part is uh, into the collet, the proper distance, then you tighten the collet closure nut. And we reminded you again, uh, you're never to leave a chuck key uh, into the collet closure or ever into a spindle. All right, next we're going to look at the steps for removing the part and then removing the collet and then eventually removing the collet closure as well. All right. All right. We've got uh, the thing tightened up in there and we're ready to roll. Uh, now, uh, just taking this out now, Don, yeah. can we reverse the process? Can I just reverse the, the movie or should we actually do it? Yeah, we can do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, don't, do we have to put that wood under there? Taking the part out oh, taking the part out first. All right. Before I can remove the collar closure. Uh, I'm going to take my part out. I'm going to remove the part. Basically, I'm going to rotate the uh, screw clamp uh, opposite direction, ro counterclockwise, and then I'll remove my piece. And one of the things you see is I'm removing the piece. I don't have any tools in here, so I don't want oh. to be jamming my hand. Or I could see that. I would be pulling, 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 then all of a sudden it would give way, and I would smack my hand right into a sharp. Right. So you take, you take the tool out? Yes, take the, okay. take the tool out. We'll go over that when we actually do some turning and facing. All right, so Don is loosening up the collet. Look at that. He's doing that fast. He puts it back in the holder, and he's putting the chuck key. Notice, chuck key's either in that spot or in his hand, never here. Okay, now he's putting the wood. He's put the notches on the ways. I'm starting to pick this up now. Now Mighty Don is now... Popping. I heard that pop, Don. Yeah. 
Kind of like popcorn. Definitely an indication that you're doing something correct. You can hear that little pop. The uh, cam locks unloosening. Oh, that one popped good. Hmm. Kind of exciting here. I was trying to get the microphone on there for you can hear a pop. Oh, there's a pop. All right. Now, when we got back to 139, where I guess Don's trying to pull that off. Could that one get stuck too, Don, and we have to use the wood thing? Yes. Okay. Once again, we're not going to bang this with anything metal. I was, it's already loose, so I'm just going to support it with my hand and show you. You're not going to hit out here. Do not hit out here. You want to hit up here on the ring that's going getting attached to your spindle. Okay. So now, Don, is it kind of like a, a vacuum suction or something or some kind of like metal bonding that keeps it on there? Yeah, it's the two tapers. You're pulling it up on a taper, so you have two, two cones that are exactly matched. And as you pull it up on there, they kind of seat themselves. Okay. All right. All right. So these things, yeah, th these things are made to be like precision mated. So there's not uh, any play in there. All right. So Don's taking that off. Obviously, now we would then uh, clean that down, stone it if necessary. Uh, probably wouldn't if we had it clean to begin with. But chips can possibly get there down there. Um, and then we would clean the collet closure as well, and then replace it out onto the table with the 139. All right, that's how you put something in with a collet. Now let's review removing a part and a collet. And then we'll eventually look at removing the collet closure itself. First off, you know, this is obviously after you turn the spindle off, you want to remove the cutting tool. Remember, that's an extremely sharp thing. If you're pulling on your part to get out of a collet and your hand slips or something, you can go forcefully into the cutting tool and get uh, badly cut. So remove all cutting tools first before removing a part. Next, you want to loosen the nut on the collet closure in the counterclockwise direction. This will allow the collet to start working its way out of the collet closure. Now when it's loosened up a little bit and the collet is still in the closure, you want to pull on your part while gently turning on it. So it's pulling and turning to, uh, to work the part out. Once the part is out, then you can fully loosen the collet and remove the collet from the closure as well. Now after the part and the collet is out, we're going to then remove the whole closure, okay, which is um, seated and mated to the spindle of the lathe. So first thing is you're going to put that wooden block that has been shown uh, on the ways because if that collet closure were to fall, you don't want it to fall onto the ways and damage that. And then after you do that, you want to loosen the nuts on the collet closure. I think Don has called these the cam locks. And when you turn those counterclockwise, you should hear them pop. Once they pop, you stop turning. If you turn too far, uh, then you're going to start tightening it back up. And like I said, you're going to, you know, you hear the popping sound. If after they all pop, all those cam nuts pop, and the collet closure is still stuck and doesn't come off, you want to hold the collet closure with one hand and gently tap. Uh, on the, the collet closure up at the surface that where the collet closure is mating with the uh, the spindle. Okay, You do not want to hit a collet closure down on its end or its nose. Okay, This could damage the collet closure and potentially even the uh, spindle of the lathe. All right, once uh, the collet closure is loosened, then you can carefully pull it away from the spindle. You're then going to wipe down all the surfaces of the collet closure inside and out and also uh, clean up the spindle of the, uh, the lathe as well. Remember, Engineering 153 students want to be known as meticulous uh, fabricators. We don't ever want to leave anything sloppy. You are professionals, so please act the role. Now lastly, the chuck key. I'm going to just say this again because it's so important because our, our biggest injury we've ever had in the 15 years we've been over at the Applied Technology Center for Engineering has been a chuck key uh, injury. So remember, 
the whole idea you never leave a chuck key in the spindle. Your hand, if, if that key is in the spindle, your hand must be on it. And the same rules apply if you're talking about a chuck key that's in the collet closure. Remember, a chuck key must either be you know, in your hand or in the wooden tool holder at the top of the lathe. Leaving a chuck key in a spindle or a closure can be very dangerous. It can strike someone's hand. It can be thrown as a dangerous projectile across the room. Uh, please do not do that. Um, chuck keys have to be in your hand or in the tool holder always. We want you to be safe because we love you. All right, that's it for installing and uninstalling a collet closure. Let's look at the questions. Number one, describe the proper process for snugging and tightening the cam nuts on the spindle in order to install a collet closure. Okay, there was a couple operations that Dan, uh, that Don did. The snug, snug one was snugging, one was tightening. So describe them. Number two, how much, how must a collet be aligned? When it's, when it's inserted properly uh, into a collet closure. How can the operator determine if the collet and the closure are properly aligned? Three, what's the minimum maximum part diameters that may be inserted into a collet having a diameter of one and 1.125 inches? So that would be one and an eighth inch collet. What should be done if a part doesn't properly fit into a collet? Four, how is the rigidity of the part affected by changes in the following parameters? A change in the length of the amount of the part inserted into the collet, and B, a change in the length of the part that extends out of the collet. And lastly, after the spindle is turned off, what is the first thing that should be done before removing a part from the collet? Why must this be done? 